Chapter 16 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gjerset. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 Life and Culture of the Viking Age. Intellectual culture is a complex and delicate fabric into which the fibers of experience and the finer filaments of secret and mysterious influence are deftly woven. Social environment and native talent fashion the texture, but the threads have been brought from many climes and every age has been laid under tribute. Wherever higher culture has been produced, a process of absorption of new elements, an accumulation of new experience, a borrowing of importation, have freely taken place. The stimulus produced by the new, with the attendant reaction of the native mind upon it, primarily determines all new cultural growth. The Greeks borrowed from the Orient, the Romans from the Greeks. From both came culture and Christianity to the rest of Europe. Even the far north had felt the thrill of this influence long before the Viking Age began, but the process of absorption of new elements had been slow, and the development uneventful. No sudden changes are noticeable till the migrations swept over Europe and roll high the billows of general tumult and upheaval. The quickening effect of this great movement tore the peoples of the north from their ancient moorings, and as Vikings they burst forth, adding new terror to this dark and bloody period. In this first outburst of pent-up energy and unrestrained passions, we see the worst instincts of a primitive race let loose in savage warfare, which often throws the deepest shadow on the pages of Viking history. But justice even here constrains us to admit that it is but a shade deeper than a similar shadow which falls over the history of all human warfare. To consider minutely all the acts of vandalism and cruelty perpetrated by the Vikings would not give us the satisfaction of having shown that their system of plunder and bloodshed differed essentially from that of the Roman generals, of the pious crusaders, the defenders of the faith, and most Christian princes of later and more enlightened ages. It must also be borne in mind that on these expeditions we meet the Vikings as warriors, and that the outrages often committed can furnish no adequate criterion for judging their life and culture in general. The nature of the Viking campaigns furnishes an easy explanation of the panic which seems to have seized the inhabitants of the countries exposed to their attacks. A cruel fate usually befell the towns and cities they seized. Not only did they kill and plunder, and carry women off into slavery, but they spared no sanctuary, and nothing holy could stay their rapacious and destructive hands. When the battle was over, and the victory won, they would celebrate the event in drunken carousals in which the skulls of their fallen enemies often served as wine bowls, and other acts equally gruesome were committed, which might well strike Christian hearts with horror. Even human beings are known to have been sacrificed to the gods, and when a city was taken, children would be transfixed with spears, and given to Odin, amid wild outbursts of triumphant rejoicing. If we add that by means of their fleets they could depart at will, only to reappear at the most unexpected moments, that the inhabitants often felt powerless over against this dreaded enemy, we can understand the people's superstitious fear, the sad laments and exaggerated stories of the old writers, and the prayers offered up in the Christian churches. From the fury of the Northmen, Lord God, deliver us. Intellectually and culturally, the whole period was one of general contraction and retrogression, in which ancient arts and civilization were forgotten, and ignorance and rude manners prevailed. Viewing the period thus, we may justly term it the Dark Ages. A tone of retrospection and sadness was prevalent among those who possessed learning and culture. They looked backward to the days of Greece and Rome as to a golden age that would never return. The sun had set, they thought. The world would never again become what it had been in ancient times. Their only consolation was that after death there awaited the Christian, a blissful life in heaven. But these dark centuries represent not only the downfall of the old, but also the birth of the new. Viewed from this side, we find the period to be an era of expansion and development in which old barriers were broken, and new opportunities were given to the peoples which had hitherto been regarded as dwelling outside the pale of civilization. On their expeditions, the Vikings had come into direct communication with nearly every part of the then known world. Their sphere of activity was thus immensely widened, and their ideas of the world were altered correspondingly. New ideas from the Christian faith, from Greco-Roman civilization, and from Irish poesy and learning poured into the north and became the leaven which brought the half-slumbering energies of the Scandinavian peoples into full activity. A new culture was produced which soon placed the peoples of the north in the front rank of enlightened and progressive nations. Norway and her colony Iceland became the center of literary activity in northern Europe during the Middle Ages, and Norse mythology was elaborated into a system which, though inferior to that of Greece in beauty, surpasses it in depth and grandeur. The Scandinavians became leaders in navigation, commerce, and discovery, 
and developed a system of laws and government which has left deep and lasting traces wherever permanent Viking settlements were founded. The maritime enterprise and naval warfare attending the Viking expeditions gave a great stimulus to shipbuilding and navigation in the north. We have seen that even before this period the Scandinavians possessed great skill in shipbuilding and could construct vessels of considerable size. In the Viking Age, a great demand made itself felt for vessels suited for long voyages, and able to carry as large a number of warriors as possible. In the Mediterranean Sea, they became acquainted with Greek and Roman ships, and every effort was now made to construct ships of large size and of improved type. The larger sea-going ships were of two kinds, merchant ships and war vessels. An early type of merchant ship was the Kjol, Anglo-Saxon Kjol, but during the greater part of the Viking Age, the Kunare, Old Norse Knur, and the Birding were common types. Later a larger sized vessel, the Buse, Old Norse Buse, came into use, and still later the Koge, Old Norse Kuger, which soon developed into a war vessel. The merchant ships were quite broad and high in proportion to their length, with half decks in the prow and stern. The goods were placed in the undecked middle part of the vessel. The ship had one mast and a four cornered sail. The mast could be folded down, and would then rest on supports high enough so that a person could conveniently pass under it. The oar-shaped rudder was fixed to the right side of the vessel near the stern. This side was, therefore, called the steerboard, Old Norse Stjernbordi, while the left side, which was at the back of the helmsman, was called the backboard, Old Norse Backbordi. Oars were used only in the front and rear ends of the vessel. Of the warships, the Askar and the Elidi were older types which seemed to have differed little from the ordinary merchant vessel. A later type was the long ship, so called because it was long and narrow, with high prow and stern. This type seems to have come into use in the 10th century. These ships were beautifully painted in various colors and were ornamented with wood carvings. Oars were used along the whole ship, and on both sides hung a row of shields painted black and yellow alternately. The prow was gilt and shaped like the head of a bird or animal, usually like that of a dragon. The sails were usually striped, red, blue, and green, and were often made of costly material. The warships were divided into various classes according to their shape and size, and the service for which they were intended. The skyth was a narrow, swift sailing vessel. The schnechja was supplied with a sort of snout. The drage, Old Norse dreki, or dragon ship, was larger than ordinary, with a prow like a dragon's head and a stern often shaped like a dragon's tail. The bardri was also a large ship built for the special purpose of ramming and sinking the ships of the enemy. It had iron rams, both on prow and stern. The warships had a full deck and second half-decks in bow and stern. The forward half-deck was called the Forstavins deck, and the rear half-deck Lüftingen. Another classification was made according to size by counting the number of row benches on one side of the ship. In this classification, the ships were known as 13 bench, 15 bench, 20 bench, 30 bench, etc., with 26, 30, 40, and 60 oars. The most common size was the 20 bench, with 40 oars, and a crew of 90 men. On the 30 bench, there were two men to each oar, or 120 rowers, the crew consisting altogether of about 260 men. King Olaf Tryggvason's famous ship, the Long Serpent, is said to have had a crew of 300 men. The scattered Viking bands, which operated in a more desultory way at the beginning of the period, were gradually united under able leaders into fleets and armies of great size. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle shows how the Viking fleets in England were growing. Year 787. In his, King Brehothric's, days came three ships of Northmen from Hereatherland. Year 833. In this year, King Egbert fought with the crews of thirty-five ships at Carum. Year 840. In this year, King Ethelwulf fought at Carum against the men of thirty-five ships. Year 851. In this year, 350 ships came to the mouth of the Thames, and the men landed and took Canterbury and London by storm. Year 877. 120 ships were wrecked at Swanawick. Year 893. In this year, the great army returned and came to land at Lemenemuth with 250 ships. At this time, the ships must have been of the older and smaller types, but if we assume that each ship had a crew of only 40 men, 350 vessels would bring an army of 14,000 warriors. Similar numbers of ships are mentioned by many other sources. The chroniclers describe in glowing colors the vast numbers of the invaders. They are compared to swarms of grasshoppers that cover the earth. The Viking ships, says an Arabian writer, fill the ocean like a flock of red birds. 
An Irish annalist says that the ocean rolls billows of strangers all over Erin. Fleet upon fleet is spewed out by the sea, so that there is not a spot on the island where the ships are not found. Excepting the ships of the Saracens in Spain, and the small beginning made by King Alfred in England, the peoples of Western Europe had, as yet, no fleets. These great naval armaments, therefore, gave the Vikings an advantage which largely explains the success which they achieved in their campaigns. The size of the army was no less imposing than that of the fleet. At the siege of Paris in 885, the Vikings had 40,000 men, of which 30,000 probably constituted the actual fighting force, if we may believe the old sources. In the Battle of Saucourt, 9,000 Vikings are said to have fallen. But the success of the Vikings was due to their superior training and equipment rather than to the size of their armies which in many cases seems to be exaggerated. Professor Oman says, But no less important than the command of the sea was the superiority of the individual Viking in battle to the average member of the host that came out against him. The war bands of the invaders were the pick of the north, all volunteers, all trained warriors. In a Frankish or an English host, the only troops that could safely be opposed to them, man to man, were the personal following of the kings and elder men of England, or the dukes and the counts of the continent and these were but a small fraction of the hasty levy that assembled, when news came that the Danes were ashore at Bremen or Boulogne, at Sandwich or Weymouth. The majority of the Herban of a Frankish country, or the Fjord of an English shire, was composed of farmers fresh from the plough, not of trained fighting men. Enormous superiority of numbers could alone compensate for the differences in military efficiency. If that superiority existed, the raider quietly returned to his ships or to his fortified island base. If it did not, he fell upon the landsfolk and made a dreadful slaughter of them. How could it be expected that the Kjarl, who came out to war with spear and target alone, should contend on equal terms with the Northmen equipped with steel cap and mail shirt, and well trained to form the shield wall for defense and the war wedge for attack? Working against the hastily arrayed masses of the landsfolk, the Viking host was like a good military machine beating upon an ill-compacted earthwork. The Viking army was a strong and permanent organization, with able commanders and officers. It had infantry and cavalry, spies, sappers, and a well-organized commissariat. It had catapults and battering rams and other machinery for the carrying on of sieges. Military tactics were well developed. There was strict discipline and perfect obedience to authority. End of chapter 16. Chapter 17 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershut. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17. Causes of the Viking Expedition The Viking expeditions may have been due to a number of causes. In the Scandinavian countries, with their limited area of tillable soil and their extensive sea coast, a seafaring life was necessitated from the start, which produced a hardy and energetic race, and fostered the spirit of daring and adventure which expresses itself in the whole movement. The size of the Viking armies indicates clearly that the population in the north was increasing at a very rapid rate during this period, owing, no doubt, to polygamy, which in one form or another was extensively practiced. The number of those who found it necessary to follow war as a permanent occupation was growing. According to the old laws, Frostathingslov and Gulathingslov, all sons shared equally in the inheritance, but as both political power and social standing depended on wealth, and especially on the ownership of land, the aristocracy would not sell their estates, nor would they destroy them by dividing them into small parcels. The young men were partly encouraged, partly driven by necessity, to seek their fortune on expeditions to foreign countries. Led by love of adventure, and encouraged by the prospects of wealth and fame, they flocked to the standards of the Viking chieftains in such numbers that the movement soon became a migration, and extensive campaigns were waged for conquest and colonization. The women and children usually accompanied the men, and were left in fortified camps while the army advanced to attack. It often happened that the women dressed in warrior's garb, and joined their husbands and brothers in the battle. As they were forced to share the perils and hardships with the men, they became inured to danger, and showed an alertness and bravery equal to that of the best warriors. Sometimes women would even become leaders of armies, like the Red Maiden, a Norwegian Amazon who led an army in Ireland in the 10th century. It is an error often repeated that the Vikings came to foreign lands as band of adventurers, married the women there, and soon forgot their own customs and language. As a rule they brought their families with them, and settlers, both men and women, came to the new colony as soon as it was safely established. 
the social organization of the home country was reproduced in the colonies, and there is ample evidence to show that the Vikings clung to their own customs and national identity with a tenacity not unworthy of so proud a race. End of chapter 17「Chapter 18 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 Towns and Commerce The military operations of the Vikings constitute, in many ways, the great features of the period. This fact, together with the fallacious idea that they were only buccaneers and adventurers, has often diverted the attention from their peaceful pursuits and extensive friendly intercourse with other nations, so important to the development of Europe. We have seen that in very early times they had maintained extensive trade relations with peoples dwelling east and south of the Baltic Sea, that they had visited the British Isles, and no doubt also the coasts of Friesland and northern France, as merchants long before they were heard of as Vikings. Towns and trading places such as Uppsala, Sigtuna, and Berka, on Maleran in Sweden, Visby in Gothland, Skiringsal in Norway, Schleswig or Hedeby in Jutland, and Dorstadt in Friesland, are known to have existed at the beginning of the Viking period. Through the Viking expeditions, these early trade relations were so stimulated and developed as to become a systematized commerce, the first of the kind in northern Europe. With their fleets of merchant ships, the Vikings opened new routes of trade. They brought the products of Russia to the west, those of southern Europe, Spain, and France to the north, and found new markets for their own articles of export. Many of their expeditions were undertaken for the sake of trade, rather than for war. When they came to a foreign land, they often entered into an agreement with the inhabitants that for a certain number of days or weeks, perfect peace should be maintained, and as long as this lasted, a lively trade was carried on. Only after the period of peace was at an end did they consider it legitimate to plunder. During this period, Norway had more products for export than most other countries, the more important being dried codfish, herring, furs, walrus skin, from which rope was made, falcons, used extensively in hunting at that time, and walrus teeth, which were considered very valuable. To the colonies and home markets, the Vikings brought the much-prized products of southern Europe, such as fine cloth, leather, wines, saddles, etc., and these new wares produced a hitherto unknown demand for articles of luxury. In 968 the Irish plundered Limerick, says the chronicler, and carried away the treasures and most valuable possessions of the Vikings, their fine saddles, their gold and silver, their beautifully woven cloth of all kinds and colors, their silk and satin, both scarlet and green, and all kinds of cloth in the same way. These were all articles which the Norsemen had imported. The foreign saddles and the fine Cordovan leather, leather from Cordova, which was in great demand, showed that they carried on trade with Spain, where they would get from the Arabs the products of the Orient. Before the arrival of the Norsemen, the Irish had no ships, only boats made of skin, for ill craft in which, however, they had been able to reach the distant islands. They had no cities or commerce, and they coined no money. To facilitate trade, the Norsemen introduced in Ireland a system of weights and measures, and here, as in Britain, they began to coin money. The words Mark, Old Norse Merk, and Penning, Old Norse Penninger, had been incorporated into the Irish language as Mark and Pingil. The growth of towns as centers of trade followed as a direct result of Viking settlement and the development of commerce. Waterford, Cork, Limerick, and other cities founded by the Vikings became important trading places, while Dublin developed into one of the leading emporiums of commerce in northern Europe. Silks and costly cloth of all kinds, leather, wines, and other products from the south were imported to Dublin, whence they were again brought by merchants to Norway, Denmark, Sweden, and Iceland. How rich and flourishing the Viking cities in Ireland were can be seen also from accounts of contemporary writers. In 941 to 942, King Merkertak made a journey through all Ireland, he also visited Dublin, and nowhere did he receive such presents as there. In a song written by a contemporary poet, his reception is described as follows. A supply of his full store was given to Merkertak, son of Njal, of bacon, of good and perfect wheat. Also was got a blood debt of red gold. Joints of meat and fine cheese were given by the very good and very pure queen, and then was given a thing to hear a colored mantle for each chieftain. After the Battle of Glenmama, in the year 1000, King Brian captured Dublin. In this one place, says the old writer, 
there were found the greatest treasures of gold, silver, and findron, a sort of white bronze, of precious stones, carbuncles, drinking horns, and beautiful goblets. The Norsemen brought with them to Ireland the ideas of cities, commerce, and municipal life hitherto unknown, says August J. Thebaud. The introduction of these supposed a total change necessary in the customs of the natives, and stringent regulations to which the people could not but be radically opposed. No more stringent rules could be devised, whether for municipal, rural, or social regulations. And as the Northmen are known to have been of a systematic mind, no stronger proof of this fact could be given. Also in the Scandinavian countries at home, and elsewhere along all the routes of trade, cities sprang into existence under the stimulating influence of Viking commerce. Rouen, in Normandy, became the most important trading center in France, and merchant vessels from Norway and Iceland anchored in the Seine. In Norway, the new commercial town of Tunsberg on the Christiania Fjord soon outdistanced the older Schiringsal, and Kringhella, a new trading town, was founded on the southeastern part. Hallura, probably located on the coast of Skåne in Sweden, and Brainerne, near the mouth of the Goethe River, became important commercial centers. A lively intercourse was also maintained between Ireland and the English seacoast towns across the Irish Sea, which had either been founded or developed by the Vikings. Several of these towns grew into prominence, such as Swansea, Tenby, Chester, and especially Bristol, which had become a great trading center, and in course of time superseded Dublin and Waterford as the greatest commercial city on the shores of the Irish Sea. In the Midlands, the towns of the five boroughs, Lincoln, Leicester, Nottingham, Stamford, and Derby, Old Norse Dyrbyr, became cities of importance, and on the east coast of England, Grimsby and York grew into prominence. At the time of the Domesday Book, York was, next to London and Winchester, the largest city in England. In speaking of the influence of the Vikings on the development of English commerce, Mr. W. Cunningham says, The English were satisfied with rural life. They were little attracted by the towns which the Romans had built, and they did not devote themselves to commercial pursuits or to manufacturing articles for sale. The Danes, though so closely allied in race, appear to have been men of a different type. They were great as traders and also as seamen. We may learn how great their prowess was from the records of their voyages to Iceland, Greenland, and America, from accounts of their expeditions to the White Sea and the Baltic, and from their commerce with such distant places as the Crimea and Arabia. Their settlements in this country were among the earliest of the English towns to exhibit signs of activity. Not only were the Danes traders, they were also skilled in metalwork and other industrial pursuits. England has attained a character for her shipping, and has won the supremacy of the world in manufacturing. It almost seems as if she were indebted, on those sides of life on which she is most successful, to the fresh energy and enterprise engrafted by Danish settlers and conquerors. By the efforts of Roman missionaries she had been brought into contact with the remains of Roman civilization, but by the infusion of the Danish element she was drawn into close connection with the most energetic of the northern races. August J. Thebode says, Endowed with all the characteristics of the Scandinavian race, deeply infused with the blood of the Danes and the Northmen, she, England, has all the indomitable energy, all the systematic grasp of mind and sternness of purpose, joined to the wise spirit of compromise and conservatism of the men of the far north. She, of all nations, has inherited their great power of expansion at sea, possessing all the roving propensities of the old Vikings, and the spirit of trade, enterprise, and colonization of those old Phoenicians of the Arctic Circle. A similar influence was exerted by the Norsemen on the naval development of France. It is the great achievement of the Normans, says Depping, that they gave France a navy. There was no longer any navy in France, and she had ceased to be numbered among maritime nations. The Normans re-established the marine, and William the Conqueror succeeded in forming a fleet, the like of which France had not seen. The conquests made by the Normans in Sicily were due in part to their superiority in navigation. It may be due to the same influence that Normandy furnishes more sailors and pilots than any other part of France, and that many of the leading French admirals have been Normans. We have seen that the Vikings had early learned to build fortifications and stone towers of great strength, that besides the fortified camps and strongholds built for military purposes, they also surrounded their towns and cities, especially in the colonies, with walls and moats which virtually made them fortresses of great military importance. The building of castles was first developed in Normandy, and the Donjon or square tower, so typical in medieval castles, is thought to be of Viking origin. In Ireland, the Norsemen began to build fortified strongholds as early as 840. 
Cork was fortified in 866, and in a saga of the 11th century Limerick is called the city with riveted stones. Dublin, where stood the royal hall or castle, with its massive stone tower, was surrounded by walls and moats, and was called the strong fortress. Waterford, too, had walls and moats, and a royal castle where the king used to dwell. An old stone tower is still found there called Reginald's Tower, Ragnvaldstorn, supposed to be the donjon of the old royal castle. It is known to have stood there in 1170, when the English captured Waterford. York and the cities of the five boroughs in England were also well fortified. The Roman towns in early Britain were destroyed by the Anglo-Saxons when they conquered the country. Of the 56 cities of Roman Britain, says W. Cunningham, there is not one in regard to which it is perfectly clear that it held its ground as an organized center of social life through the period of English conquest and English settlement. Many of these old ruined cities were rebuilt by the Vikings, and many new ones were founded. These Viking cities were the first to show the signs of municipal and urban life, both in Great Britain and Ireland. They became centers not only of trade, but also of industry, as the Danes and Norsemen also devoted themselves to industrial pursuits, and produced wares of their own make for the general market. The Vikings had a keen sense for legal justice, and maintained strict order in their towns. They developed a system of city laws of which traces are still found in English city government. End of chapter 18「Chapter 19 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19. Dress, Houses, Food and Drink. The many new wares brought to the north by enterprising Viking merchants increased the comforts of daily life, and created among the higher classes a taste for fine clothes, ornaments, and luxury in various forms, which exerted a marked influence on cultural life in this period. From early ages the Norsemen had woven their own wool and cloth, but it was a coarse and common fabric which they had not learned to dye in striking or delicate colors. Linen, le rept, was also in common use. The new commerce brought rich supplies of costly fabrics from abroad, silk, satin, and fustian, a cotton cloth, scarlet, Latin scarlatum, pell, and purple were brought from Spain, France, Flanders, and England. Men of higher rank took great pride in wearing scarlet mantles embroidered with gold and trimmed with costly furs. The skald Gunlau Gormstunga received such a mantle from King Sigtrig in Dublin, and Igel Skallagrimson received a costly mantle from King Ethelstan for composing a song in his honor. When Kjartan Olafsson from Iceland came to King Olav Tryggvason in Norway, he wore a scarlet mantle, and when he left the king gave him a complete dress of scarlet cloth. From Arinbjorn Hersa, Egil Skallagrimson received a silk cloth ornamented with gold buttons, the women exhibited the traditional feminine predilection for ornaments and fine dress. The song Rigsdula, in the Elder Edda, describes the lady visited by Rig, the god Heimdall, as follows. The wife sat, mindful of her arms, smoothed the veil, stretched straight the sleeves, made stiff the mantle. A brooch was on her bosom. Long was the train on her silk-blue dress. The wife bore a son, and swaddled him in silk, sprinkled him with water, and called him Jarl. When the Irish sacked Limerick in 868, they carried away the beautiful Viking women dressed in silk. The saga writers often dwell with pride on the elegant attire of the persons prominent in their narrative. Gunnar of Liderenda rode to the thing with all his men. When they came there, they were so well attired that there was nobody there so well dressed, and the people came out of the booths to look at them. One day, when Gunnar came from the thing, he saw a well-dressed woman approaching. When they met, she greeted Gunnar. He returned her greeting and asked what her name was. She said that her name was Halgard, and that she was the daughter of Hoskud Dalla Kolson. She was rather forward in her speech, and asked him to tell her about his travels. This request he did not refuse, and they sat down and talked together. She was dressed in the following manner. She had a red skirt well ornamented, and over it she wore a scarlet cloak embroidered with gold. Her hair hung over her bosom, and it was both long and beautiful. Gunnar wore the scarlet clothes which King Harald Gormson had given him, and on his arm he had the gold ring which he had received from Hawken Jarl. The Norsemen were quick at imitation, and soon learned to dye their own homemade cloth in various colors. New fashions, too, were introduced from abroad, which becomes apparent from many foreign names of articles of dress which came into use at this time, such as Socker, Anglo-Saxon Sock, 
Hirtil, Anglo-Saxon Schirtil, equals coat. Coppa, medieval Latin coppa, cloak. Mortal, medieval Latin mantelum, mantle, etc. The tailor makes the gentleman, says the proverb, and true as this seems to be, the Norsemen had fully learned to appreciate this side of culture. Neither did they forget to lay stress on fine manners and courtly bearing. Tall, blonde, stately, and self-conscious, they were manly and striking figures, and when in foreign lands they stepped before the kings and rulers in their finest attire, with gilt helmets and richly ornamented swords, they were not easily mistaken for barbarians. In Ravensmull, a song by King Harald Harfogres Herdsgald, Torbjorn Hornklova, composed after the battle in Hofersfjord, 872, a raven and a valkyrie describe in dialogue King Harald and his men. Says the valkyrie, About the skalds I wish to ask, those who follow King Harald, since you seem to know so much about brave men. The raven. From their dress you may know, and from their rings of gold, that they are the king's friends. Red mantles they wear, they have fine striped shields, silver decorated swords, brinies of ring mail, gold embroidered shoulder straps, and ornamented helmets which Harald selected for them. The description of the famous Norman warrior Robert Guiscard, given by Anna Comnena, the gifted daughter of Emperor Alexius, would fit just as well his Viking ancestors of a couple generations earlier. She finds fault with his fierceness and his greed, but his manly qualities won her highest admiration, though he was her father's enemy. The Robert here mentioned was a Norman of quite humble extraction. He coveted power, in character he was cunning, in action quick and energetic. He eagerly desired to get possession of the wealth of the rich, and he carried out his wishes with irresistible energy, for in the pursuit of his aims he was resolute and inflexible. He was so tall that he carried his head above the largest men. He had ruddy cheeks, blonde hair, broad shoulders, and clear blue eyes, which seemed to flash fire. He was slender where he should be slender, and broad where he should be broad. In short, he was from top to toe, as if molded and turned, a perfectly beautiful man, as I have heard many declare. Homer says of Achilles that when he spoke it was as if a multitude of people were making noise, but they say that Robert should shout so fearfully that he could drive away thousands. It is natural that a man with such physical and intellectual qualities would not bend under the yoke nor submit to anyone. The higher classes in Norway did not live in castles like the feudal aristocracy in France or Germany, but dwelt on their country estates, where they engaged in farming and cattle raising when they were not absent on Viking expeditions or occupied in commercial pursuits. The farm labor was done by slaves, but even men of high station would put shield and sword aside and join in the work. We read in the sagas that Gunnar fra Liderenda was in the field sowing grain, that Thorbjörn Öchnermegen was in the meadow making hay, and that King Sigurd Seer was superintending the harvest when his stepson, King Olaf Haraldsson, visited him. The life in the home was still one of patriarchal simplicity. The wife managed the household, looked after the work, and waited on her guests at the table. As a token of her dignity as head of the household, she carried in her belt a bunch of keys. In the Rigstula, she is called the Hagen Lutla, or the lady with the dangling keys. Besides the regular household duties, the women, even of the highest standing, spent much time in weaving fine linen and in embroidering tapestries of beautiful design. The men spent much of their spare time at metalwork, wood carving, and the making of weapons, in which arts they possessed great skill. The houses were simple but well-built log structures. The principal house was the Skala, Old Norse Skali, a long rectangular hall, often of great size. The gable over the main entrance was ornamented with carved dragon heads or deer horns. In the front end, in or near which the main entrance was located, were two smaller rooms, the Forstua and the Kleve, over which there was a loft. In the gables there were usually windows made of a thin membrane, as glass was not yet used for that purpose. On the side walls of the hall there were no doors or windows. If the hall was large, the roof rested on two rows of pillars. Along the middle of the hall was a fireplace, a rin, and above it in the roof was an opening, the liori, through which the smoke escaped. Benches were placed along the side walls, and at the middle of one of these walls was placed the high seat for the head of the family. Hasethi, Unvegi, with high carved pillars on each side. The Unvegi Siller. Across from this seat by the opposite wall was a second and simpler high seat for distinguished guests. Across the rear of the hall was placed a bench for the women, the Tverpal, behind which were enclosed sleeping chambers. 
The benches along the walls were also used as beds at night by the men. At mealtime, tables were placed in front of the benches on both sides along the hall, and when the meal was over, they were removed. The walls were hung with shields, weapons, and woven tapestries. Sometimes they were ornamented with elaborate wood carvings, like Olaf Paw's Hall at Hjartarholt, in Iceland, described in the Lachdula Saga. Of other houses, the most important were the Dingya, or Shema, where the women spent most of their time, and where they did their weaving and needlework, and the Svefenbir, where the lord of the household slept with his family. Usually there was also a burr, Jungfru burr, where the young women stayed. The slaves had their own houses. Great delight was taken in feasting and social entertainments, and the most generous hospitality was shown every wayfarer. It was regarded not only as a sacred duty, but as a pleasure and privilege to entertain strangers. Instances are mentioned in the Landnama book, where the scala was built across the road, so that no stranger could pass without entering the house. The husband and wife would then stand ready to invite the travelers, and to offer them food and drink. Says the Havamal, in the Elder Edda, Fire needs he who enters the house, and is cold about the knees. Food and clothes the man is in need of who has journeyed over the mountains. Festivals were held in connection with religious exercises, weddings, funerals, and other home events, and also in the winter, especially at Christmas time. The saga of Olaf the Saint, in the Heimskringla, relates how Asbjorn Selsbana continues the old practice of his father of having three festivals every winter. To such festivals a number of guests were invited. Before they assembled, the tables were set up in the hall and covered with beautifully embroidered linen tablecloths. Thin, wafer-like bread served as plates. Ordinarily, the men and women took their meals apart, but at festivals the women sat with the men at the table, occupying the inner end of the hall to the left of the main high seat, while the men were seated at the other end toward the main entrance. Bowls of water and towels were passed around so that the guests could wash their hands both before and after the meal. Wine and ale were served with the food, which was both abundant and well prepared. Again, we must quote the Rigstula, which describes how Rig, Heimdall, was entertained at the home of a man of higher social standing. Then took Muthir, an embroidered tablecloth of white linen, and covered the table. Took she then thin leaves of white wheat bread and put on it. And she set filled dishes and silver plated vessels on the table, and fine ham and roasted fowls. Wine was in the can, they drank and talked till the day ended. The women took pride in filling their chests with fine table linen, sheets, bed curtains, and fine cloths, but they also devoted themselves to more intellectual pursuits. As the designs with which they adorned linen and tapestry generally represented events from history or tradition, they had to become acquainted with mythology, and the lives and deeds of the heroes and great men of their people. The practice of medicine and surgery was left to them. They bandaged the wounded, and healed and nursed the sick. At times the women would also be priestess, superintending the sacrifices and religious ceremonies, and especially in early times she might be vulva or scythkona, a woman who was believed to possess the power of witchcraft and prophecy, and a knowledge of the supernatural. Woman's position in society was, on the whole, one of great freedom and independence. Among the higher classes, at least, she was looked upon as man's equal. She might be his companion in battle and in the banquet hall. When she married, she received a dowry from her father, and a nuptial gift, Munder, from her bridegroom, which remained her own property throughout her married life. In the management of the household she had full authority. So great an influence did women exercise on the ebullient passions of the Norsemen that they appear as the easily discerned cause of bloody domestic feuds and dramatic historic events, like the fates themselves, breeding discord and bloodshed, or fostering peace and blessing by petty intrigues, by a nod or a smile. The sagas have pictured most vividly a gallery of interesting women. Some beautiful, jealous, plotting and revengeful, causing endless feuds, like Halgerd, Gudrun Uzvi's daughter, Fredis, and Queen Gunhild. Some proud and ambitious, like Bergthora, Queen Asta, and Sigrid Storada. Some affectionate, mild, and devoted, like Helga the Fair, and Thorgerd Egil's daughter. We hear of domineering wives and henpecked husbands, like Aka and Grima, but also of women truly great, like Aud the Deep-Minded, Unr, a lady of rare talents, who as widow became the acknowledged head of the family, and managed both her own affairs and those of her daughters, and relatives so well under all difficulties that no one did anything of importance without seeking her advice and assistance. These historic and self-assertive women of the Viking Age have a certain romantic charm. Still woman had not yet been accorded her proper privilege in society or in the house. 
the most sacred relations were yet marred by harsh and corrupt primitive customs. Marriage was not based on mutual love and affection, but on wealth and social standing. It was a business affair, a contract concluded between the bridegroom and the bride's father and relatives. The bride's consent was necessary, it is true, but it was often a matter of form rather than the result of natural inclination. Many a touching love affair is recorded in the sagas and elsewhere in Old Norse literature, but they usually represent the revolt of the human heart against harsh and selfish social laws. Love was regarded as a weakness, and a young woman was considered as being disgraced if a young man mentioned her name in a love song. The husband often had concubines besides his legally wedded wife. It also happened that men traded wives, or that a man gave his wife away to a friend if he did not like her. Divorce was common and easily obtained. There was nothing sacred in this most intimate and important relation into which human beings can enter. In Viking culture we find the shadows and blemishes characteristic of pagan civilization at all times. The Norseman had a keen and well-developed mind, but his heart was as hard as the steel of his sword. He loved the battle and the stormy sea. He admired the strong, the brave, the cunning, the intellectual. For the old and feeble he had no interest. For the suffering no sympathy. The weak he despised. He sang of valor and of heroic deeds, none of love and beauty. The sagas of the rich and powerful have been written, the poor and unfortunate classes are passed over in silence. But in the Viking Age the life-giving spirit of Christianity was breathed gently also upon the pagan north. Unconsciously at first the hard heartstrings were loosened, and the soul was stirred by a new life. Notes of love and sadness steal into their songs. Words of affection and sorrow are chiseled on their tombstones. Woman gradually rises to new dignity and the rights of the heart gain recognition. Even religious life is deeply affected by this gentle influence. The light of the world had cast its first faint glimmer upon the intellectual and moral life of the North. The Viking expeditions had begun to bear their greatest fruit. End of chapter 19「Chapter 20 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gjershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20. Religion and Literature Wherever the Vikings settled, they established a well-developed social organization, infused a new vigor into the peoples with whom they came in contact, and imparted to them ideas which germinated into new cultural growth. Along practical lines, they were often much farther advanced than the nations which were subjected to their attacks. This was especially manifest in Ireland, where the people at the time of the Viking inroads yet lived under a tribal organization amid most primitive economic and social conditions. Not only did they lack a well-organized army, ships, commerce, cities, roads, and bridges, but they paid little attention to agriculture, living for the most part on their herds and flocks, with which they moved from place to place. They were, as a rule, cruel and sensual. Their warfare was savage. The position of women was low and degrading. Their houses were usually miserable huts. Yet this people possessed a remarkable intellectual culture, and became in this field the teachers and benefactors of their enemies, the Norsemen. They had been Christians for many centuries before the Vikings began their conquests. Their missionaries were laboring, not only in Scotland and England, but had penetrated to the remote forest regions of Germany and France, to Switzerland and northern Italy. Even in the solitudes of the Faroe Islands in Iceland, pious Irish monks had erected their hermitages. They had great scholars who diligently studied Greek and Latin authors, and profound philosophers like John Scotus Erigena. During the 7th, 8th, and ninth centuries, the Irish schools became celebrated all over Europe. Not only Greek and Latin, but philosophy, astronomy, mathematics, and geography were studied. The Irish cloister schools became the refuge of those who loved intellectual culture in the Dark Ages, and scholars from many countries flocked to them. Alcuin, the great scholar at the court of Charles the Great, corresponded with one of the professors of the Irish school at Clonmacnoise whom he calls his dear master and teacher. Also, in their own native tongue, they produced a rich culture, both in prose and poetry. Heroic tradition flourished. Sagas were written to commemorate the deeds of great chieftains, or to preserve the knowledge of the clan and of family relationships, and songs were composed by skalds in honor of their kings. They sang, too, of love and of the beauty of nature, with a sweet tenderness strange in those days when such poetry was almost unknown. But both their poetry and their prose suffered from an overflow of fancy and feeling, uncontrolled by artistic taste. The wildest exaggerations abound. The characters are grotesque, superhuman, and indistinctly drawn. There is an obscurity and lack of form which stands in the sharpest contrast to the brief, lucid style 
and psychological character painting in the Norse sagas. That the religious and literary life so highly developed among the Irish, their love of nature, their lyric sentimentality, and sympathetic and emotional character made a deep impression on the stern Norseman is certain. They, who came to conquer, were in turn conquered by this new and gentle influence. Long before they were converted to Christianity, their lives and views were deeply affected by ideas acquired in the Christian countries which they visited, and especially through their sojourn in Ireland. It was largely due to this new stimulus that Norse skaldic poetry and the saga literature began to flourish in the Viking period, and that Norse mythology assumes at this time a distinctly new form in which we find embedded in the strata of pagan thought many unmistakable fragments of Christian ideas, as the conceptions of creation, of righteousness, of good and evil, as well as views of the life hereafter, which can have their origin only in the realm of Christian faith and morality. The skaldic poetry falls into two general groups, the skaldic songs, so-called because they are written by skalds whose names and careers are known, and a body of old songs by unknown authors, called the Elder Edda, or Norin Fornkvedi. The skalds were usually connected with a king's herd or court, and produced songs to extol the person and achievements of their patrons, on whose munificence they lived. These songs, which contain much valuable information regarding persons and events of early Norwegian history, are usually composed in a most intricate verse form, the Drothkvet, which abounds in word transpositions, allusions, and metaphoric expressions, Kenningar, which offer many difficulties to the modern reader. This verse seems to have been invented by Braga Bodasson, Braga the Old, who lived in the first part of the ninth century and is the first Norwegian skald to whom we have any record. There were also skalds who did not stay at the courts, and who composed songs in more varied subjects. Egil Skalle Grimson, one of the great masters in skaldic song, and Ulf Uggason, the author of the Hudstrapa, may be mentioned. Egil is well known from his songs Hufuslasen and Arnbjörnstrapa, but especially for his great poem Sonatoric, in which he laments the loss of his sons. Noteworthy are also Cormac's Mansongsviser, Love songs to the beautiful Steingerd. Many of the saga writers were also skalds, noticeably Snorra Sturluson and Sturla Thordson. Snorra, the author of the Heimskringla, has also written the Younger Edda, a most important work intended as a book of instruction for young skalds. The work has preserved the names of a great number of skalds, together with fragments of their songs, and furnishes a key to the many difficulties in skaldic poesy. It gives a review of mythology, Gilfagining, which a skald must necessarily know. It explains the poetical and metaphorical expressions, Chaiti, Kenningar, Kenningar, used in skaldic poetry, and a poem written to King Hakon Hakonson and Shula Jarl illustrates all the verse forms used by the skalds. The Elder Edda consists of two series of songs, the mythological and the heroic, written by skalds whose names are not known. Besides the poems about Helga Hudingsbane and Helga Hjorvardsson, the heroic songs deal with the great Nibelungen tradition, and constitute the first literary embodiment known of this great Germanic epic. The Eddic poems have preserved a much older form of this tradition than that found in the Nibelungen lead. In the mythological poems we find clearly set forth in verse of classic simplicity and beauty, the Norsemen's ideas of creation, the lives and character of their gods, the destruction of the world, and of man's destiny after death. In the Havamal, we find outlined also their great moral conceptions, and their view of life in general. The grandest of all these old songs is the Volospa, the prophecy of the Volva. This Volva can be none other than Erd, Old Norse Erdr, one of the three Norns, or goddesses of fate, Erdr, Verdandi, and Schuld. The gods are assembled in council at the well of Erd. Odin calls the Volva from the grave, and the great Sibyl comes forth to reveal to the god of wisdom what even he does not know. The mysteries of creation, the destruction of the gods, the end of the world, and the happy existence in the life to come. She commands silent attention, and tells the assembled gods that in the beginning there was neither sand nor sea, nor cool billows. The earth did not exist, nor the heavens above. There was a yawning abyss, but nowhere grass before the sons of Burr lifted up the dry land, they who created the beautiful earth. The sun shone from the south on the stones of the hall, and the earth was covered with green herbs. The sun, the moon, and the stars did not know their proper courses, but the mighty gods held counsel, and gave them their right orbits, dividing time into night, morning, midday, and evening. The Gilfaginning presents a more complete account of creation, 
giving in fuller detail a myth which is outlined also in the Vofthrudnismal. Here we learn that in the beginning there were two regions, one of fire and heat, called Muspelheim, ruled over by Sirt, who watches the borders of his realm with a glowing sword. When the end of the world comes, he will conquer the gods and destroy the earth with fire. The other was a cold region, Niflheim, Old Norse Niflheimer, from which twelve rivers issue, called Elivagar. Between these two regions is the great abyss Genungagap. The masses of ice which had accumulated on the northern side of this abyss finally caught the spark of life from the heat issuing from Muspelheim, and a great man-shaped being, Ime, Old Norse Ymir, was produced, from whom the Jutans descended. The gods killed Ime, and from his body they created the earth, from his blood the ocean, from his bones the mountains, and from his skull the heavens. From sparks from Mispelheim they made the sun, moon, and the stars, and placed them on the heavens. Again the gods assembled in council, says the Volva, and created the dwarves in the earth. From two trees, ash and elm, they created man and woman. Odin gave them the spirit, Herner gave them reason, and Lodor color and warmth of life. The gods were amusing themselves at the gaming tables, and there was no lack of gold until the three powerful maidens came from Jotunheim. These maidens are the three Norns or goddesses of fate, already mentioned. Strife had not yet begun. The gods were happy in this golden age, which lasted until the fates appeared to determine the destiny of gods and men. But the elements of discord had entered the world, gold, woman, and witchcraft. The goddess Gulvig, who seems to be a personification of all three, was killed in Odin's hall and this caused the first war, that between the Aesir and the Vanir, the two tribes of gods who now contend for supremacy. Odin threw his spear into the throng. This was the first combat in the world. A peace was finally concluded, according to which the two tribes were united on equal terms. The personification of evil itself is Loki and his children with the giantess Angerboda, Old Norse Angerborda. The three monsters Hel, goddess of the underworld, the wolf Fenre, Old Norse Fenrir, who at the end of the world will kill Odin, and the Midgarsomer, or Jormungand, the world serpent, a personification of the ocean encircling the earth. The world, in which there is now continual strife, is represented under the symbol of a giant ash tree, the Yggdrasil, whose top reaches into the heavens, whose branches fill the world, and whose three roots extend into the three important spheres of existence outside the world of man. One root is where the Aesir dwell, under this root is the well of Erd, where the gods assemble in council. Another root reaches to the home of the Jutuns, or Rimthusar, Old Norse Hrimthursar, under which is the well of Mimir, the mountain of wisdom. The third root is in Niflheim, and under it is the terrible well Vergelme, by which is found the snake Nidhogger, which together with many others continuously gnaws at the roots of the world tree, and seeks to destroy it. Nidhogger, is the symbol of the destructive forces operating in the world. An ash tree I know, Yggdrasil called. Yggdrasil called. A tall tree sprinkled with water. From it comes the dew that falls in the valleys. Evergreen it stands by the fountain of Erd. Much do they know the three maidens, who come from the hall which stands by the tree. One is Erd, the other Verdunde. Shul is the third. Laws they make, they determine life and the fate of men. The Norns are not only in the world, but they are the real rulers of it. Even the gods must submit to their decrees. They rule over life and death and man's destiny. No one can escape the calamities which they have preordained. But they have not the absolute power attributed to the fates in Greek and Roman mythology. They are also subject to an ultimate fate. They disappear at Ragnarok, Old Norse Ragnarokr, together with this present world. Again the gods assembled, says the Volva, to consider how evil had come into the world. Odin, who is interrogating her, tries to conceal his identity, but she recognizes him and tells him the great secrets of his life. In Norse mythology, Odin is the chief divinity and the father of many of the other gods, but it is evident that in earlier periods other gods have held the highest position. T, Old Norse Tyr, the god of war, Anglo-Saxon Tius, Old High German too seems to be the same divinity as the Greek Zeus, and has no doubt at one time been the principal god. Thor, the god of thunder and lightning, must also have ranked higher than Odin, but in Norse mythology he has become Odin's son. He is constantly fighting the wicked Jotuns, at whom he hurls his hammer Mjolnir, the thunderbolt. 
He is the farmer's special protector and benefactor. He shields them against the hostile forces of nature, and furthers husbandry in all peaceful pursuits. In Norway, he was worshipped more extensively than any other god. Odin, Anglo-Saxon Wodan, Old High German Wotan, German Ruthen, seems originally to have been a storm god, but in later periods he becomes so prominent that he pushes the older divinities from their throne. Odin is an embodiment of the spirit of the Viking Age. Even in appearance he is a chieftain, tall, one-eyed, gray-bearded, attired in a blue mantle, carrying a shield and the spear Gungna, Old Norse Gungnir, which never misses its mark. His life is rich in all sorts of adventures. He loves war and is generally found in the midst of the battle. He is also the god of wisdom, and his desire for knowledge is almost a passion. His two ravens, Hugin and Munin, bring him daily notice of everything that happens in the world. No sacrifice is too great if thereby he can gain more knowledge. How did he lose his eye? It is a great secret, but the vulva reveals it. He drank once from the well of Mimir, the fountain of wisdom, and had to give one of his eyes as a forfeit. Odin is the personification of the heavens. His one eye is the sun. The other, which Mimir took, is the sun's reflection in the water. He also discovered the runes, but only by making another great sacrifice. The Havamal gives the following account of it. I know that I hung on the windy tree nine nights together, wounded by a spear, sacrificed to Odin, myself to myself, on the tree which no one knows from what root it springs. Neither with food nor with drink was I refreshed. I looked carefully down and raised up the runes. Crying, I raised them up, and fell then down. Even this great pain Odin is willing to undergo to discover the runes, for through him he gains occult knowledge, and becomes the god of sorcery, the wisest and most powerful of all the gods. From his throne Lidskelf, Old Norse Hlidskelf, he overlooks the whole world. He is always thoughtful, and meditates on great problems. Evil and good are equally interesting to him, for both reveal some secret of life. He contemplates the mystery of existence and the approaching end of things. He is never glad because he knows too much. In Osgard, Old Norse Asgarther, the gods build a beautiful hall, Gladsheim, for the gods, and another, Fingolf, Old Norse Fingolf, for the goddesses, but greater than any of these was Odin's own hall, Valhall, Old Norse Valhall. To this hall the Valkyries bring the dead warriors who fall on the field of battle, and they are feasted and entertained by Odin himself. All who die a natural death are excluded. The heroes find their pastime in fighting, and many fall every day, but they rise again unharmed and return to feast in Valhall as the best of friends. Another divinity who is in the Viking period must have undergone a great change, and who seems to reflect the new spirit of that age, is Balder. The opinions of scholars with regards to the Balder myth are hopelessly at variance. A. Ulrich thinks that Balder is an old sun god, that his death signifies the victory of darkness over light, while H. Schick thinks that he was not a real god till shortly before the advent of Christianity. According to Saxo Grammaticus, he was a young and impetuous warrior who waged many combats with his rival Hothar, by whom he is finally slain. He is a son of Odin, but lives on the earth. Sophus Bugge considers this to be the older form of the myth. In the Voluspa and the Gilfagening, he is pictured as the gentle god of innocence and righteousness, so bright that a light of glory surrounds him. He dwells in the hall Breidablik, the far shining hall, where nothing impure is found. He is wise, kind, and eloquent, and so just that his decrees cannot be altered. His wife is Odin's granddaughter, the faithful Nanna. His son is Forshete, the god of justice and reconciliation. While Baldur lives, Eel can gain no real control in the world, but bad dreams begin to trouble him, and as this portends some great misfortune to the Aesir, Odin saddles his eight-legged horse Sleipne, Old Norse Sleipner, and rides to Niflheim to learn what evil is thus foreboded. He calls the Volva from her grave, and asks her for whose reception they are making preparations in Hel's kingdom. But she answers that it is for Baldur who will soon die. This news causes great consternation among the Aesir, and they assemble in council to discuss the matter. Frigg, Baldur's mother, requires everything in the world to take an oath not to harm her son. The gods now feel secure, and in their joy that the danger is averted, they amuse themselves by throwing all sorts of things at Baldur to show that nothing will hurt him. But Loki comes disguised to the enemy, and learns from Frigg that there is a tiny plant, the Mistletine, which she has not required to take the oath, because it seemed too small. He pulls up the plant, 
brings it to the assembly, and asks the blind god Hud, Hudr, to throw it at Balder. Hud does so. The plant pierces him through, and he falls dead. The greatest misfortune has happened. Nana's heart breaks of sorrow, and she is buried together with her husband, who is received by hell in her kingdom. But there is a hope even in this great calamity. While Balder lies on the bier, Odin whispers something in his ear. This episode is mentioned in the Vafthrudnismal, where Odin asks the wise Vafthrudne, What did Odin whisper in his son's ear before he was laid on the funeral pyre? This is a riddle which even Vafthrudne cannot solve. He answers, No one knows what in the beginning of time thou didst whisper in thy son's ear. No one knows. But it was, no doubt, a promise that he should not remain forever in Hild's realm, but that he should return when the world of strife had passed away and the new life of peace and righteousness had begun. In Norse mythology, as elsewhere in old religious systems, the ideas of the life hereafter are often vague, even contradictory. Mythology is a growth, a product of long periods of a people's intellectual development, in which old ideas have constantly been mixed with new conceptions. It represents a march of the human mind forward to new light, rather than a once-for-all perfected system. The Hell myth is an illustration. Hell, the name both of the goddess and of the realm over which she rules, is sometimes thought of as the home of all the departed, where even Baldur goes after death. Hence the Norwegian expression, Hatslå i hell, i.e. to kill, to deprive one of life so that he goes to hell. But hell is also thought of as the place for the wicked. Hell, the goddess, is white on one side and black on the other, and her hall is described as a frightful place. We have seen that from the earliest times the Norsemen believed in a life after death which is shown by many burial customs. In course of time, they began to construct large burial chambers where all the members of the family should be interred together. Professor H. Schuch thinks that these graves first endangered the idea of the lower world. He says, A primitive people does not think of the death as annihilation, but rather as an entrance into new life. Only by premising such a belief can a number of antique burial customs be explained. At first the dead person lived in this new life in the grave itself and these large family graves gave origin to the idea of the realm of the dead. According to the oldest belief, then, all the dead came to this realm where hell ruled. But it was a shadowy, joyless existence, and the feeling that heroes and good people deserve something better give rise to new creations, to Valhall, Odin's Hall, Folkvang and Sesrimne, Sesrimnir, where Freya entertains one half of all the fallen heroes. Fingolf, Vingolf, where all heroes are entertained by the goddesses, and to the idea that all women who die unmarried go to the goddess Gefjun. Hell and her kingdom fell into disfavor, and were painted in ever darker colors. Loki did not escape punishment. He was tied by the Aesir in a rocky cavern where poisonous adders drop venom into his face, and there he will have to lie till Ragnarok, or the end of the world. But his faithful wife Sigyn stands always by him, and gathers the dripping venom in a cup. Only when she empties the cup does it drop into Loki's face and then he writhes in pain so that the earth quakes. Hud, the slayer of Baldur, is also punished. With the goddess Rind, Odin has the son Vale, who kills Hud. But revenge cannot remedy the mischief done. Baldur the good has perished, and evil triumphs. In her hall, Fensala Frigg weeps for her son. The end is approaching, Ragnarok, when gods and men must perish, and the present world will be destroyed. Another divinity which, especially in Sweden, was worshipped more extensively than Odin himself, was Frey, the son of Njord, the god of the sea. He was the god of weather and of harvests, and was regarded as the giver of riches. He became so enamored with the beautiful Jotun maiden Gerd that he could neither eat nor sleep. One day he sat on Lidskjald in Osgard and saw her far to the north, and so beautiful was she that he made sky and ocean resplendent with light. He sent his servant Skirna, Shernir, to woo her, but in order to win her, he had to surrender his greatest treasure, his sword, and when Ragnarok comes, he will be slain by Surt, because he has no weapon with which to defend himself. Heimdall, one of the oldest deifications of the heavens, is the sentinel of the gods, and lives at Bifrost, the celestial bridge over which gods and men ride to Valhall. Vidar, the silent one, is next to Thor the strongest of the gods. Ega, Egir, is the ocean god, and Braga the god of poesy and eloquence. In Norse mythology there are twelve or thirteen principal gods, and an equal number of goddesses, Asenjur. Frigg is Odin's wife and the queen of heaven, and dwells in Fensala, far to the west where the sun sets in the sea. 
Freya, the beautiful goddess of love, lives in Folkvang, where the great hall Sesumne is found. To her belongs one half of the warriors who fall on the battlefield, and she is accorded the right of first choice. Idun, Braga's wife, called the good goddess, keeps the apples from which the gods eat to preserve their youth. Thor's wife is the beautiful Siv, Sif, with hair of gold. Shada, Njord's wife, was, like Gerd, of Jotun race, and Snotra was the goddess of good sense and womanly graces. Before Ragnarok, evil passes all bounds. For three years there is perpetual strife. Brothers fight and kill each other. The ties of blood relationship are broken. Morals are corrupted, and one person has no compassion for the other. Then follow three years of constant winter, the Fimble winter, the Great Winter. Finally, Yggdrasil trembles. Fenrir breaks his fetters, and the Midgard storm comes out of the ocean. Cert, the fire demon, comes. Loki is free again and leads the sons of Muspel and other forces of destruction to the final battle with the gods on the plain Vigrid. Fenrir kills Odin, but is in turn slain by the powerful Vidar. Thor and the Midgard storm kill each other. Frey is slain by Cert. T fights against Hel's hound Garm, and both fall. Cert finally hurls fire over the earth. The sun grows dark, the earth sinks into the ocean, fire consumes all. The world of strife and bloodshed has disappeared. Out of the ocean, says the vulva, rises a new green earth, where grain fields grow without being sown, and where no evil exists. Here, on the fields of Ada, the gods who have survived Ragnarok reassemble. Baldr, who has returned from hell, is there. Also Vidar, Hud, Herner, and Thor's sons, Mode and Magna. A new race of men are also born. Pursuing her story, the vulva says, A hall I see on the heights of Gimle, brighter than the sun and covered with gold. Righteous men shall dwell there in endless happiness. This hall is a perfect contrast to Valhall, where the heroes even after death amuse themselves by fighting and slaying each other. In Gimle, the righteous live in peace and happiness. Gimle is the safe and secure home ornamented with precious stones. Sophus Bugge thinks that the fields of Ida are in reality the Christian Garden of Eden, and that Gimla is the heavenly Jerusalem described in Revelation 12, 10-21. 10. And he carried me away in the great spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. 11. Having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. 21. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And, says the vulva, bringing her narrative to a closing climax, From above comes to the great judgment the powerful one, the ruler of all. This is the ruler of the new world whose name not even the vulva knows. In Norse mythology the world is pictured as a scene of perpetual struggle between good and evil, a never-ending combat between the powers of life and the forces of destruction, and it is especially noteworthy that this struggle is a great tragedy in which the gods suffer complete overthrow. Baldur was killed, Loki and Fenrir broke their fetters, the struggle against evil has been unsuccessful on every point. Most of the leading gods themselves are destroyed by the forces of evil in the great final battle at Ragnarok. But evil, too, passes away with the world of strife in which it has existed. This thought of the overthrow and destruction of the greatest gods seems to be a new feature which could not very well have been developed until the faith in the old divinities was beginning to waver, and people began to feel that there was a heaven higher than Valhall and Fingolv, that true happiness was not to be found in strife, but in peace and righteousness, and that there was a god whom they did not yet know, who was more powerful than the Aesir, and who in the new world would establish a reign of justice, peace, and happiness. The Hindlu Yoth says, Then comes another god, still mightier, but his name I dare not mention. Few can now see farther than to Odin's meeting with the wolf. This worship might be carried on privately in the home, where the head of the family was sacrificed to the gods, and bring offering to their images but it was usually conducted in temples, Hov, Old Norse Hof, or in simpler sanctuaries, Horg, Old Norse Horger, of which no description is given in the old writings. They seem to have been simple structures, stone altars or the like, erected in the open and dedicated especially to the worship of goddesses. In the Hindlulyoth, Freya says, Horg he built me, made of stone, now the stones have turned to glass, with fresh blood of oxen he sprinkled them, Otter always believed in goddesses. R. Kaiser and P. A. Munch are of the opinion that many of the stone circles found in Norway are remnants of this kind of sanctuaries. 
These circles, which are formed by placing great stones in an upright position, are often very large, and may have had an altar in the center. The temple consisted of two parts, the large assembly hall, or nave, and the shrine, a smaller room in the rear end of the building, corresponding to the choir of the Christian churches. The images of the gods were placed in a half-circle in the shrine. At the center stood the altar, Stolar, upon which lay a large gold ring, Baugr, upon which all solemn oaths were sworn. The bowl containing the blood of the sacrificed animals, Chautboli, was placed on the altar by the priest, Gothi, who, with a stick, Chautain, sprinkled it on the images of the gods, and on the persons present. The meat of the animals was boiled, and served to the assembled people in the large hall of the temple, where toasts were drunk to the gods for victory and good harvests. The sanctuary and the grounds belonging to it was called Ve, a holy or sacred place, and anyone who violated its sanctity was called Vargi Vium, wolf in the sanctuary, and was outlawed. Three religious festivals were held each year, one at the beginning of winter, October 14th, the Winternatsblot, or Hausblot, to bid winter welcome, another at midwinter, January 14th, Midwintersblot, for peace and good harvest, and a third, Summerblot, held on the first day of summer, April 14th, for victory on military expeditions. The temples seem to have been quite numerous, but especially well known were the ones at Sigtuna and Uppsala in Sweden, at Lyra, Hledra in Denmark, and at Skiringsal in Norway. There was in the north no distinct class of priests. The priestly functions were exercised by the herser and the jarls, and even by the king himself. Women, too, might serve as priestesses, gidja. In Iceland, the gode, Old Norse guthi, held about the same position as the herse in Norway. He was a chieftain, and the temple in which he served as priest was built on his estates. End of chapter 20「Chapter 21 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gership. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21. Early Social Conditions in Norway The first account of early Norwegian society is given by the Rigstula, which describes the various social classes, and pictures conditions which resemble those of early Germanic society elsewhere. Rig, the god Heimdall, comes to a hut where he finds Ae and Edda, an old couple, gray-haired from work and hardship, sitting by the fire. Edda, who wore an old headgear, set before the visitor coarse bread and other simple food. Their son Thrall was stoop-shouldered and coarse-featured, with dark complexion and wrinkled skin. They evidently belonged to some foreign race, brought to Norway either as prisoners of war or as slaves bought in the numerous slave markets. Thrall married without much ceremony the flat-nosed and sunburnt Thier. Their children were called Fiosnir, stable boy, Drumber, the clumsy one, Ambot, slave, Tathrukipia, the ragged one, etc. When they grow up, they do all sorts of menial labor. They manure the fields, build fences, and herd goats and swine. This is the slave class, which must have been quite numerous. Rig proceeded on his way, and came to the home of Ave and Alma. The man was busy making parts for a wooden loom. He wore a tight-fitting shirt, his beard was in order, his locks hung over his forehead. The wife sat spinning and was well-dressed. Their son was called Karl. He was married to Snor, with due ceremony according to custom. He tamed oxen, made wagons, built houses and barns, and drove the plow. Their children were Hall, Bonda, Hald, Tegn, Bode, etc. This is the farmer class, those who own land and devote themselves to agriculture. The Karls were the lowest class of landowning freemen, peasants. Below them were the freedmen and renters. The Halds, Storbundi, were an aristocratic class of landowners, a gentry who held their land by inherited right and title, Odel, and were said to be Odel born. At the head of the Halds stood in each herod, or district, an hereditary chieftain, or hersa, who was their leader in war and commanded the local subdivision of the army. He exercised also priestly functions, and presided at the thing, Old Norse thing, or the assembly of the people. Rig then came to a hall where Fader and Moder lived. The man was engaged in making bows and arrows. He belonged to the aristocracy. 
The wife decked the table with a fine linen tablecloth, placed silver vessels on it, and served wine, wheat bread, ham, and roasted fowl. She was blonde and was elegantly dressed. Her brows were light, her bosom lighter, her neck whiter than the white snow. Their son was the golden-haired Jarl, who married the blonde and beautiful Erna, daughter of Hersa. From them the king descends. Over against their neighbors, the Swedes and the Danes, the Norsemen felt themselves to be a distinct people from times which far antedate the beginning of authentic history, but they did not at first constitute a united nation. They consisted of a number of independent tribes, occupying quite well-defined districts. The names of many of these tribes are given by Jordanus, and Procopius says that thirteen tribes lived in Scandinavia, the Gautar being the most numerous. The names of Egder, Riger, Horder, Raumer, Heiner, etc. are still preserved in names of provinces and districts in Norway, like Agder, Rogaland, Hordaland, Romerike, and Hedemarken. The tribe consisted of families to whom belonged the greater part of the land, and who, by virtue of wealth, influence, and tradition, possessed all religious and political power. The title to the land was held by the head of the family, but the real ownership was vested in all the members jointly. It was called Odal, and the principle seems to have prevailed that it could not pass out of the possession of the family. All the sons shared equally in the inheritance, but the old homestead was not divided, but was usually inherited by the oldest son. The younger sons received other portions of the estate, where they sold their interest and sought their fortune elsewhere. The village system did not obtain in Norway, as among the Anglo-Saxons and Germans. Each family dwelt on its own separate estate. In Anglo-Saxon, the word tun means town. In Norse, it means the place on which the dwelling is located. The people were divided into filker, Old Norse filki, to folk, equals people, and each filka placed in the field an organized military force under its own commander. The filker constituted the larger units of the army. A parallel to this system is found in the Anglo-Saxon tribal organizations, and especially in the division of the tribes into smaller groups. East Saxons, South Saxons, West Saxons, North Folk, and South Folk. The Filka had its own temple, and its own thing, or assembly of the people, where suits at law were tried and decided. The Filka was divided into Herider, Old Norse Herav, Her to Rav, a military command, which corresponds to the hundreds among the Anglo-Saxons, and the Sentina among the Franks. This seems to have been a district large enough to furnish a hundred warriors, which formed the unit of military organization. The Hersa was the hereditary tribal chieftain, while the Jarls had about the same powers as petty kings, and ruled over large districts. Before Harald Horfagra's time, most districts were governed by kings, Filkeskunger, who ruled over larger tribes, such as Riger, Horder, Egder, Raumer, etc., but not till after the union of Norway did the king become distinctly superior to the Jarls. The movement towards a union of independent but closely related tribes into a thjalv, Anglo-Saxon Thjod, Gothic Thjoda, or people, seems to have been well underway, both in Sweden and Denmark, already in the early centuries of the Christian era. Svitjod, the kingdom of the Swedes dwelling around Maleran, has already been mentioned, also Gatjod, the Gautor or Gutar, inhabiting the districts farther south, about the great lakes Venern and Vetern. Denmark was united into one kingdom under the Skjolding dynasty prior to 500 AD. In Norway, where deep fjords and snow-covered mountains made inland travel in early times difficult, and laid great obstacles in the way of closer intercourse between the different districts, national unity was effected later and with more difficulty. But from very early times the trend of social development towards the ultimate union is clearly seen in the growing tendency to merge the isolated tribes into larger confederacies, and to adopt for these a uniform system of laws which were gradually made operative in larger districts. The oldest confederacy was, probably, that of the Heiner, Old Norse Heidner, dwelling in Hedemarken by the great lake Mjösen, in the eastern part of Norway. They are mentioned in the Old English poem Widsith, and the runic inscription on the rookstone in Östergötland, Sweden, states that, together with Horder and Riger, they made a warlike expedition to Sealand in Denmark, under a common king. Their confederacy must have existed as early as at the time of the birth of Christ, and seems to have embraced, besides the Heiner, also Raumer, Ringer, and Hader in Romerike, Ringerike, Hadeland, and other districts. Together they constituted the Eidsivalag, i.e., the people united under a common law, called the Eidsivathingslov. The place of the common assembly, or thing, Eidsivathing, was Eidsvold, 
at the lower end of Lake Musen. The name of the place of assembly brought about a change of the name Heidsevislog to Eidsevelog. More powerful was the confederacy Trondelagen, formed by eight Filker dwelling in the old Throndheimer, the district around the Trondheimsfjord. This region, which has been inhabited as long as records can trace the existence of Norsemen, is one of the best agricultural districts in Norway. The large areas of fertile soil, which form an undulating plain around this great fjord, explain sufficiently the fact that in very early times Trendelagen was one of the wealthiest and most densely populated districts, and was regarded as the heart and center of the country. Snorra calls it the center of the country's strength. The Trinders took little active part in the Viking expeditions. They regarded their own districts as the most desirable place to live in, and were too strongly attached to their own homes to be fond of adventure or emigration. Trendelagen consisted of two parts, Indtrendelagen, or the four inner Filker, Sparbuen, Verdolen, Inafilka, and Schogen, and Utrondelagen, the four Filker situated towards the mouth of the fjord, Styrdalen, Strinden, Guldalen, and Orkedalen. Trendelagen had two things, Urething, on Bretern, in the present city of Trondheim, and Frostething, on the peninsula Frosta, in Indutrondelagen. Every farmer who had a manservant had to attend the Urething, which assembled once a year. At the Frostething, 400 representatives met from the eight Filker, 40 from each Filker in Introndelagen, and 60 from each Filker in Utrondelagen. The Frostething grew in importance, and gave its name to the body of laws called Frostathingslov, which was adopted by the whole northern part of Norway. Each Filker had its own temple and Filkes thing, and governed itself in all local matters. The thing, Old Norse thing, was the assembly of the people in which the freemen met to decide matters of common interest. It was also a court of law. The log things, or larger assemblies, like Ura thing and Frosta thing, tried all cases of greater importance. They were also appellate courts to which cases were brought from the lower courts. The president of the lag thing appointed a body of judges, the lagvite, usually thirty-six in number, chosen for one session, who served under oath and had to interpret and apply the law in the cases that came up for trial. The decision prepared by the Lagreta was submitted to the whole assembly for approval. The institution of Lagmand, plural Lagmand, was also found in Norway, though it was not so important as it became later in Iceland. At first the laws were not written, and the Lagmand was one learned in the law who could recite it to the assembly. It seems that in Norway several Lagmand acted together in declaring the law. The place of assembly was one of peace and sanctity. Every man must go fasting into court and no drink shall be brought to the thing, either for sale or otherwise, says the Frosta thing's love. The place where the Ligretta sat was regarded as a sanctuary, and was surrounded by ropes, vebend, the sacred cords. Dueling with swords was not infrequently resorted to in settling disputes. It was called homgang, because the duels were generally fought on a home or small island. When blood was drawn, the affair was regarded as settled, and the losing party had to pay a sum previously stipulated. A duel between the skald Gunlag and his rival Raven led to its abolition in Iceland by the Althing in 1006. In Norway, it was abolished about 1012. After Christianity was introduced, the ordeal became a mode of trial occasionally resorted to. Its best-known form in Norway was the Jernbeard, which consisted in carrying a red-hot iron or in walking barefoot over hot plowshares. This mode of trial was abolished in 1247. In Trindelagen, with its two lag things, and dual arrangement in general, there were, besides the Filkishov, two great sanctuaries, one at Marin in Sparbuen, one of the most renowned heathen temples in Norway, and one at Lada in Utrandelagen, near the present city of Trondheim. Before King Harald Horfagr's time, there were no kings in Trindelagen. At the head of each Filke stood a chieftain, who was also priest and leader of the people at the thing. His office was hereditary, but whether he bore the title of Herse, which was customary in Norway, or was called Gerda, like the chieftains in Iceland, is not known. The two Filker, Nordmir and Romsdal, petty kingdoms from very ancient times, also belonged in a general way to the Frostathings log. The people of Romsdal had their temple on the little island of Vee, the island of the sanctuary, in the Romsdals fjord. South of Romsdal lies Sundmur, a Filke which had its own king and was the home of some of the most powerful families in the early history of Norway. 
Especially noteworthy is the great Arnmirling family, the descendants of King Arnvid, who fell in the Battle of Solskjell, fighting against Harald Halfagre. They resided on the island of Giske, near the present city of Alesund, where a number of interesting archaeological finds have been made. The Sundmerings were great seamen, and took active part in the Viking expeditions. North of Trendelagen, a large seacoast region fringed with thousands of islands stretches for many hundred miles towards the borders of Finnmarken. This is Nordland, or as it was called in earlier times, Halagaland. The great cod and herring fisheries, for which this region is still noted, made it in early days one of the most populous districts in Norway. Whale and walrus were caught here in large numbers, and the district was for centuries the center of the rich fur trade of the north, until it was finally surpassed by Novgorod in Russia in the 11th century. The powerful chieftains in Halagaland carried on a lucrative fur trade with the Finns in Finnmarken, on whom they also levied a tribute which brought them a large income. Lithera says that the most precious thing for the chieftains in Halagaland is the tribute paid to them by the Finns. This consists of furs, feathers, whalebone, robes, and ship ropes made from walrus hide. The people of Halagaland were enterprising merchants and sailors. They went on trading expeditions to southern Norway, Denmark, and the British Isles, and followed routes across the mountains to the Gulf of Bothnia. Many trading centers sprang up, like Vagar, Kabelvag, and Tjata, noted later as the seat of the great chieftain Horek of Tjata, still one of the largest country seats in northern Norway. Also Sandnes and Bjarki, later the home of the powerful Torahund. Wealth was accumulated, and literature and culture flourished. Three of the Edda songs, Vullundarkvida, Himiskvida, and Grimnismal, are known to have been written in Halagaland, and here lived also the great skald Eivid Skaldaspiller. The jarls of this district were among the most powerful chieftains in Norway at that time. They had large fleets and ruled over the whole region from Finnmarken to the Trondheimsfjord, including also the districts at the mouth of the fjord. In the southwestern part of Norway, the three filker, Fjordafjölke, Nordfjord and Sindfjord, Signafjölke, or Sogn, and Hordeland, including Nordhordland, Sindhordland, Hardanger, and Voss, were united at the Gulathingslag, a much looser confederacy than the Trendelag. Fjordafjölke and Sogn are named after the fjords, while Hordeland bears the name of the Horder, one of the oldest known peoples in Norway. They are mentioned by Cesar in the year 58 BC, when, according to his account, 24,000 Harudis arrived and joined Ariovistus. Hordeland was a very mountainous region with numerous fjords, and but a small area of tillable soil, and the Horder became great seamen and Vikings from very early times. It has already been noted that the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle mentions them as the first Vikings in England, and from that time on this region remained the center of Viking activity in Norway. They extended their power over neighboring tribes and districts, and Fjordafjölke and Sogn seem to have been new settlements founded by them. The Gula thing was held every spring. Twelve men were chosen from each of the three Filker as a legrette by the chieftains who presided over the thing. In the mountain valleys farther inland, the old organization, with petty kings and full tribal autonomy, still existed unmodified by any tendency towards union. In southern Norway, the Christiania Fjord, known in earlier times as the Foldenfjord, extends for a distance of about sixty miles into the fertile and beautiful region called Viken. This district, which lies in close proximity to Sweden and Denmark, and faces the Skagerrak and the Baltic Sea, was most favorably located for intercourse with other states. Rich soil, a fine climate, fisheries, and trade made it an attractive and populous region. In early days it became a harbor for foreign influence and new ideas, a center of progress and development, in which was found all that was highest of art and culture in the north at the time. To the west of the fjord lay two filker, Grenland, the land of the Grani, and Vestfold. To the east of Vingelmark, and southward from Svinesund, to the Goethe River stretched Ronrike, the land of the Ragnarichi, also called Alfheimer in the sagas, which in later times became a Swedish province. In the southern part of Vestfold, near the coast, lay the famous sanctuary Skiringsal, around which a town had grown up. Othera says in his report to King Alfred the Great that he lived in Hologaland, and that there is in southern Norway a town called Schiringsal, Schiringesil, to which one can sail in a month by resting in the night if the wind is favorable. As a commercial town, it was soon outstripped by Tunsberg, not far away, on the west side of the Christiania Fjord. 
In the neighborhood of Tunsberg lay a number of sanctuaries dedicated to various divinities, whose names are still traceable in Bosberg, Baldersberg, Hossum, Halsheimer, Horgen, and Oseberg, the land of the Aesir, where the Oseberg ship was found. The art and wealth exhibited in the grave chamber of the queen or princess buried in this ship furnish singular evidence of the culture and power of the princes of Vestfold in early ages. The kings of Denmark had won supremacy over this province. When this happened is not known, but in 813 the ruling native princes acknowledged the Danish king's overlordship, and Vestfold became a Danish province. But the powerful king Godfred of Denmark, who ventured to begin war even against Charlemagne, was killed by one of his own men in 810 and a period of confusion and strife between rival claimants to the throne was the result. During this period, the Inglings came to power in Vestfold, a family which was destined to rule over all Norway and to unite it into one kingdom. They quickly seized the opportunity and made Vestfold independent, but the Danish kings continued to claim it, even as late as the reign of Valdemar the Victorious. End of chapter 21《ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル》、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、ヒストリーオブノルウェーズンピープル、In the Hindluljolf, in the Elder Edda, the Schilfings and Inglings are mentioned as different families. Inglings means descendants of the god Ingve, who was worshipped in Jutland and northern Germany. He was later considered identical with the god Frey, from whom the Schilfings were supposed to descend, a circumstance which probably gave rise to the idea that the Schilfings and the Inglings were the same family. Alexander Bugger thinks that the Inglings originally came from Vestergötland. They came to Norway through marriage, and Vestfold became their real home. Gudrud Veidekonga was the first ruler of Vestfold who called himself king, a title which he assumed after he had succeeded in freeing himself from Danish overlordship. His son, Olaf Gerstadolf, who succeeded him as king of Vestfold and Grenland, became the father of the great sea king Ragnvald Heidumhera, in honor of whom Theodolf wrote his Inglingatal, and from whom the Norwegian kings of Dublin descended. But better known than Olaf Gerstadolf is his younger brother Halfdan Sverta, the father of King Harald Harfagra, who seems to have been a gifted and energetic man with some of the lofty ambition and talent for organization which distinguished his great son. Halfdan was only one year old at his father's death, but when he became of age he forced his brother to share the kingdom with him. Through successful wars he made himself master of one district after another, until he ruled over nearly the whole of Ostlande, southeastern Norway. Tradition says that King Halfdan organized the Eidsivathingslag, but this is much older, though Halfdan no doubt increased its significance by adding to it the districts of his kingdom in order to strengthen its organization. Through the marriage of a daughter of King Harald Gulsjeg of Sogn, he was also able to add that district to his kingdom, and at the time of his death in 860 his kingdom was the largest and best organized in all Norway. He had introduced a system of general taxation which the people considered very oppressive because they were not used to paying taxes, but he seems nevertheless to have been held in high esteem. According to the sagas, he was drowned while crossing the Ransfjord on the ice in the winter of 860. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershet This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23 Harald Horfagra Unification of Norway. When Halfdan Svarta died, his ten year old son, Harald Harfagra, ascended the throne of the kingdom which he had founded. Harald's reign marks the beginning of a new epoch in the history of Norway, in which the union of the whole country under the rule of the Ingling dynasty was effected. The petty kingdoms, jarlums, and aristocratic confederacies were welded by Harald into a national monarchy with a system of government and administration which placed great power in the hands of the ruling sovereign. What Charlemagne had done on the continent, and Eckbert and Alfred in England, King Harald Harfagra did for Norway. It can scarcely be doubted that the example of these great rulers, as well as that of the neighboring states of Sweden and Denmark, which for long periods had been united in strong kingdoms, fired Harald's ambition, and that many important features in his system of government were due to foreign influence. 
About Harald's early life comparatively little is known, but all sources agree that at the death of his father he was ten years of age. The Fagerskina says that at that time he was young in years, but fully developed in the manly bearing which befits a king. He had a luxuriant growth of light hair which looked like silk. He was tall, strong, and beautiful, wise, prudent, and energetic. Old men admired him, and young and vigorous men sought him because of his renown and generosity, and the splendor of his court. According to the sagas, his mother's brother Guturm was his advisor and the leader of the army, and Ragnvald Myrjarl must also have been his counselor and assistant. When Halfdan Svarta died, the kings and other petty princes in eastern Norway, who had been forced to acknowledge his overlordship, rose in rebellion against his youthful successor. King Gandalf of Ranrike made an expedition against Harald, but he was defeated and slain, and his kingdom was seized. Somewhat later, the Swedish king occupied the territory between the Glommen and the Goethe River, but Harald made a successful campaign against him, and recovered the territory, over which he now placed Guttorm as a sort of markgraf to protect the borders. The kings of Ringerike and Hedemarken, aided by Toten and Hadeland, also rebelled. It is said that they made an agreement with Gudbrand, the herse of Gudbrandsdal, that they could combine to resist Harald. They assembled to form an alliance against him, but Guttorm fell upon them and destroyed them by setting fire to the house in which they were assembled, and Harald also added Gudbrandsdal to his kingdom. By such vigorous measures he soon overcame all opposition, and not only preserved intact his father's kingdom, but even enlarged its borders. Snorra, in the Heimskringla, tells how through a fortuitous circumstance he hit upon the idea of making himself king of all Norway. He sent messengers to woo a young maiden by the name of Gida, the daughter of King Eric of Hordeland. But she answered proudly that she would not marry a king who ruled over only a few filker. She was surprised, she said, that no king was found who wished to rule over Norway, as King Gorm did over Denmark and King Eric and Uppsala. She told the messengers that she would marry Harald when he had made himself the ruler of all Norway. This message they brought back to Harald, who thought that she had spoken wisely. She has reminded me of those things, he said, which I am surprised not to have occurred to me before and he made a vow that he would not cut or comb his hair before he had conquered the whole country. When this was accomplished, he again sent messengers to Gita, who now gave her consent, and the two were married. This little romance is ingenious in invention, like so many other poetic stories connected with the name of the great king. In the Fagershina, a similar story is told about Ragna, the daughter of Adels the rich. The ultimate union of Norway was already clearly foreshadowed by the trend of political development which formed a part of a general European movement toward a form of monarchy in which the king possessed as near as possible the totality of governmental powers. Hafdan Svarta had manifested a similar ambition, and might have come much closer to its realization but for his untimely death. Harald's kingdom was the largest in Norway. He was young and ambitious. He was surrounded by energetic men and wise counselors. Nothing could seem more natural to him under the circumstances than to continue the work which his father Hafdan had begun. Harald permitted the districts in Oplandana to retain their own local kings, who now, in a sense, became his vassals. The Herse of Gudbrandsdal was also allowed to retain his old dignity upon paying taxes, and acknowledging the king's overlordship. Harald now crossed the Dovra Mountains to Trindelagen, which submitted to him without difficulty, as did also Halogaland and Namdalen, where the powerful Jarl Håkon Grotgardsson ruled. Jarl Håkon was the king's friend, and aided him in establishing his authority over this part of Norway. Harald spent the winter in Trøndelagen, which he now considered as his real home. He built a residence at Lada, near the present city of Trondheim, which later became the seat of the powerful Lada Jarls, and spent his time in building a fleet, and in systematizing the administration. In the spring he set sail with his fleet for Nordmer and Romsdal. One decisive battle was fought at Solskjell, where King Hundjov of Nordmer fell. His son, Solva Klova, saved himself by flight, and the two provinces submitted to Harald. Out of these districts he created a jarldom, to which he added a little later also the district of Sundmer, and placed his friend Ragnvald Mörjarl in charge of the administration. From him descended the Orkney Jarls and the Dukes of Normandy. In Vestlande, where by this time the Viking activity held full sway, the love and local autonomy of unrestricted personal independence was most intense. The aristocracy feared nothing so much as a possible restriction of their old rights, and the overlordship of a national king. As Harald's success greatly alarmed them, they united their entire strength, and sought assistance even in the Viking colonies in the west for a decisive combat with the ambitious king. No single district could assemble a larger fleet, 
nor raise a stronger force of well-trained warriors with able leaders than Vestlande. And when the hostile forces finally met in Hasfjord, on the coast of Rogaland, in southern Norway in 872, King Harald well knew that he faced the most critical struggle of his life. The battle is described in a poem by Skald Thorbjorn Hornklova, who tells how King Luva fought against Kjotve, the stout one, and Hoklang, the one with the long chin, whose men were armed with white shields, Gaelic swords, and spears made in the west. Luva, Old Norse Lufa, thick hair, was a name applied to Harald Horfagra in his younger days, because of his heavy growth of hair. Kjotve seems to be a nickname by which the skald designates King Gudrid of Agder, while Haklang, from whom he received aid, seems to have been his son Olaf the White of Dublin. King Olaf, who had driven out the Danes, and had re-established the power of the Norsemen, ruled in Dublin for many years, together with Ivar, probably Ivar Bonus, the son of Ragnar Lodbrok, with whom he seems to have formed an alliance. In 871 he left Ireland and never returned, which indicates that he must have died on his expedition. The three fragments of Irish annals found in 1860 states that in 871 King Amleb, Olaf, went from Erin to Lachlan, Norway, to wage war with the Lachlanegg, Norsemen, and help his father, Gottfried, because the Lachlanegg had begun war against him, and he had come to ask his son for aid. Haklung, Olaf, fell in the battle, says Hornklova. This explains why Olaf never returned to Ireland. It is clear that the kings of Vestlande, with their combined forces under the leadership of Gudrid, assisted by a Viking army from Ireland under King Olaf, met Harald in the Hofsfjord, but they were defeated after a fierce battle in which King Olaf fell. The overthrow of the opposition was complete, and Harald was acknowledged king of United Norway. During these wars, Harald had created both an army and a navy, and it became necessary to maintain these military organizations to protect the kingdom from foreign and domestic enemies. Piratic expeditions within the borders of Norway were now forbidden, and all inhabitants had to swear fealty to the king or leave the country. Many of the chieftains in the districts which had offered the stoutest resistance chose to emigrate rather than submit to Harald. Their estates were confiscated and became royal domestic lands, the property of the king. Of these estates he retained a number, which he placed in charge of royal overseers, Armen, and these lands became one of his chief sources of income. The greater part of the confiscated lands he gave to his followers as a payment for services rendered or to be rendered. They received the lands, not in full ownership, but in Weitzla, which means that they were entitled to the income from them in return for which they should collect taxes, furnish fully equipped men for the army, and be of aid and service to the king. King Harald derived income also from various other sources. The trade with the Finns, and the tribute paid by them, was made a royal monopoly. All derelict property belonged to the king. He also levied a personal tax on his subjects, probably also a tax on certain special privileges and incomes. The Armand were the local collectors of these taxes. This royal office, or sissel, together with that of overseer, was later given to officers called sisselmand. Snorra says that Harald placed a jarl in each filka, who should maintain law and order and collect taxes, of which he should retain one-third for his expenses and for the maintenance of his household. Under each jarl there should be four herser, who should have an income of twenty marks a year. Each jarl should furnish sixty men for the king's army, and each herser should furnish twenty. This arrangement seems to have been made, however, only in the districts which had offered the most determined resistance, in consequence of which the old institution of Filkis King was abolished, and royal officers were placed in charge of the local administration. We have seen that in Oplanana, and in Gudbrandsdal, the old system was retained, and the same was, no doubt, the case in Trindelagen, and in fact, in all districts which had submitted voluntarily to the king. The name and office of Hersa was retained, but later the Hersa became Lendermand, Old Norse Lendermather, an office which corresponded in general to their old dignity. But while the Hersa was an hereditary chieftain and a leader of the people, the Lendermand was a royal official who held his position by appointment, and as a rule, this new dignity never became fully hereditary. The Jarls were no longer independent rulers, as of old, but became the highest officials under the king. They were the leaders of the army in war, conducted the deliberations at the thing, collected the taxes, and had charge of the local administration in larger districts. Especially powerful were the king's old friends and assistants, Guttorm, Hakon Grokgardsson, and Ragnvald Myrjarl, who ruled over many filker. The sagas, especially the Egil's saga, which is very hostile to Harald, pictures his government as a usurpation of power, a veritable tyranny. Snorra says that wherever Harald acquired any territory, he took the Odal away from the people, and forced them to pay a land tax. 
The odel was a right to full ownership of land, vested permanently in the family, the members of which had a right to redeem the property, if it should be sold to anyone outside of the family. This was a very important right, which secured the power of independence of the large class of freeholders. To judge from the statement in the Egil's saga that in every filka Harald took all the odel, and all land inhabited and uninhabited, even the sea and the waters, and that all freeholders, bunder, should henceforth be his tenants, one might be led to think that the king was the owner of all the land and had introduced the feudal system in Norway. But this is a manifest exaggeration. The feudal system was not at that time developed anywhere in Europe, and it was never introduced in Norway. With the exception of the confiscations already mentioned, the people no doubt retained their odel now as heretofore, and there is no evidence that they even had to pay a land tax, such as the sagas complain of. Harald left undisturbed the things and the old legal system, and the Egil saga states that shortly after the king's death, Egil Skallagrimsson brought a suit on behalf of his wife against Bergamund at the Gulathing, maintaining that she was entitled to inherit one half of the castle left by her father, Bjorn Herse, both of real and personal property. This shows that the right of Odel existed at that time. What Harald did was to levy a personal tax on the freeholders, possibly also a tax on certain incomes. This had been done before by his father Halfdan, but it was otherwise an innovation. As people had never been accustomed to paying taxes, they regarded this as a sign of dependence, and as so great an encroachment on their liberty that it was tantamount to depriving them of their odel and their rights as freemen, and of reducing them to tenants under the king. From very early times the kings and chieftains had a band of personal followers called Drut, or Verdung, corresponding to the comitatus of the early German chieftains. In Harald's time the name Herd came into use, and many foreign manners and customs were introduced. Ambitious young men flocked to Harald, and the herd, which originally had been a very simple institution, became a real court, famous for its splendor and fine manners. King Harald Horfagra was the strictest of all kings with regard to conduct and courtly etiquette, says the saga. Liberal gifts, some of high office or other good fortune, awaited those who gained the king's favor. The Egil saga tells that King Harald sent word to Kveldu fra Fjordena that he wished that one of his sons might become a herdmand. Kveldulf, who had been an opponent of the king, told his son Thorolf that he thought they would reap nothing but misfortune from it. But Thorolf answered, Things must then take another turn than I expect. I think that the king will give me great advancement, and I have determined to go to him and become his man. I have heard that this herd consists of the very best men, and it seems to me a great advantage to be among them if they will receive me. They are also better provided for than any other men in the land. The king is said to be very generous and always willing to promote those who deserve it. But I have heard that those who resist him and do not seek his friendship accomplish nothing. Some leave the country and some become tenants. Like Charlemagne and Alfred the Great, King Harold was also a patron of literature. Many scalds came to his court, and the herd became the center of intellectual life and literary activity. We hear of scalds before this time, but the herd scald poetry which consisted mainly of laudatory songs composed to commemorate great events and the lives and deeds of kings and princes, seems to have been developed at Harald's court, where new themes and opportunities were offered the poets. The union of Norway and Harald's great achievements created a new national pride, which is freely voiced in the songs of the Herdschelds. Hitherto the poets had sung about mythology and heroic traditions. Their songs were composed in the clear and classical literative verse. Their names they gave to oblivion with a certain proud disdain which does not covet honor as did the authors of the songs of the Elder Edda. The Herdschelds sang of the great events of the day, and praised the achievements, and extolled the renown of the kings and princes who were their patrons, and who rewarded them liberally for their songs. They sought honor as well as reward, and their names have been handed down to posterity. They composed their songs in a new and intricate verse form, the Drothkvet, abounding in word transpositions and metaphoric expressions, Keninga, in which Irish influence can be recognized, Ireland being the only country where a like verse form and a similar poetic literature was found. The most noted skalds at Harald's court were Thjaldolf of Finn and Thorbjörn Hornklova, who had already been mentioned. Less known are Ulve Knuva, Ulf Sebason, Guttorm Sindria, and Aldun Ilshada, the oldest of them all, who had been skald at the court of Harald's father, Hafdan Svarta. Court jesters were introduced to create diversion and entertainment for the herd, and games resembling dice and chess, turning and breitspil, were much indulged in. Music, especially the playing of the trumpet and the harp, declamation of poems by the skalds, 
Rich ornaments, fine clothes, and courtly manners added charm to this circle of gifted and prominent men who constituted the herd of King Harald Harfagre. Many features of Harald's great work are, as already indicated, clearly traceable to the influence of Charlemagne and Alfred the Great, from whose constructive statesmanship he gathered both inspiration and ideas. His plan of making Norway a united kingdom and of dividing the country into jarldoms, or larger administrative districts, are ascribable in the main to this influence. The revival of learning produced by Charlemagne after the darkness and confusion of the migrations must have inspired him, also with the noble ambition to become a patron of literature and a teacher of good manners to make his court an intellectual center and to foster in his people a true appreciation of the ennobling influence of higher culture. The stirring events at home, together with the stimulus given by the Viking expeditions, and the influence of the art and culture of the nations with whom the Norsemen now came into more immediate contact, produced in Norway a great intellectual awakening, the fruit of which was the skaldic poetry, the Eddas, the sagas, valuable historical works, and collections of old laws. In the field of literature, as in the domain of seamanship and maritime enterprise, the Norsemen manifested the most original and versatile genius of the age. King Harald learned, indeed, from others, but he was not a mere imitator. All accounts of him, whether friendly or hostile, agree in describing him as a gifted and truly great man. He was tall and strong, and a rich growth of flaxen hair crowned his majestic brow. He was a kingly and imposing figure, who inspired confidence and respect. In peace, as in war, he exhibited the same talent for organization which made him able to shape a well-ordered system in every field to which he devoted his attention. He pursued his aim with great energy and perseverance, and his hand fell heavy on those who resisted. In many cases he might have been arbitrary, even cruel and despotic, but he possessed, on the whole, a mixture of sternness and moderation which made it possible for him, not only to accomplish his first great aim, but to overcome all opposition and to rule in peace during a long reign. End of chapter 23